Amen. If you look at Psalm 73, you, if you read the entire psalm, which if you have not, I highly recommend you do that. Because you have to be mindful that if you read Psalm 73, you can ask this question when you read it. The, it, it is written from what position of the writer? In, it, in other words, is it written from a current complaint? Or is it written to give God the praise? Is it an acknowledgement of his own way, waywardness, talking about the psalmist, and allowing doubt to overtake him? Because doubt does overtake him in this. I want to invite you to the first word. It says, truly. Now, that, that word, truly, truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. That word is an emphatic word. You say, well, what does emphatic mean? It means forcible, strong, impressive, as an emphatic voice or a tone or pronunciation. So it, it talks about intensity. And look at the intensity of what he is saying. Truly. So what he's doing, he's, he's announcing attention. In other words, pay attention. Truly, God is good to Israel. Now, we know that that's God's chosen people, but we also know biblically in a practical standpoint that that nation has repeatedly lived in and expressed a, a spirit of rebellion against God. That's just what they've done. Now, in Psalm 78, look there real quick. Psalm 78, I want to show you some things about Israel, but I also want to show you about this statement, God is good to Israel. And what's the verse say? Even to such as are of a clean heart. Now, Psalm 78, if you look with me in verse uh, 10 and 11. Psalm 78, 10 and 11. It says in verse 10, well, look at verse 9. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of their God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed uh, them. So when you look at their rebellion, just the state of rebellion, and then you look at God's goodness in verse 12. Look at verse 12. The Bible said, marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand as in heat. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud and with all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. Hey, you know what? God has been good to Israel. Truly, God is good. But then in verse 17, And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Could God furnish a table in the wilderness? But look at verse 20 and look at how God responds. Understand, truly, God is good to Israel. The Bible said in Psalm 78, 20, Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he uh, give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore, the Lord, the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. So the Bible said in Psalm 73, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But God enacted judgment on them. You can look at it on your own time in Psalm 78, 31 through 34. But God is good and his mercy is everlasting. That's in Psalm 78, verse 38 through 40. So here we see in Psalm 73, let's go back there. Psalm 73, I want to mention this to you. Even such, so God, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart, even to such as are of a clean heart. 
Do you know Psalm 42 and verse 11 says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquietened within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now that's something that's very remarkable. The Bible said that God is the health of your countenance. So sometimes when someone says, check your countenance, it doesn't mean you just have a rotten attitude. It means you might want to check your relationship with God. Notice what it says. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance. You know, if you're a saved person, it ought to show somewhere in your life, right? It certainly should show in your disposition. <laughs> Amen. So Psalm 51 says this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Okay, so in verse 1, Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. David McCoy used to make this statement. His pastor, a friend of mine, he passed away. Many of you know him, and he, he used to always say, it pays to serve God, and I'm not apologizing for the blessings of God. Amen. That's right. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But I want you to look at this admission in verse 2. Because we, we have the essence of Proverbs 24, 19, on fretting over evil and being envious at the wicked. It's really a perplexing portion of Scripture that God gives us to examine. But there's a confession here. In Psalm 73, verse 2, it says, But as for me. You know, that's where we are in our generation. Uh, Patrick Henry said, Give me liberty or what? Give me death. And then uh, in the 1800s, they said, Give me what? Liberty. And now what do they say? Give me. Right? It's all about me. It's not give me liberty, give me death. It's just give me, give me. That's our attitude. He said, but as for me. Now, wait a minute. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me. So he's saying, let me tell you what my problem was. God is good to Israel. God is good to those that are of a clean heart. But as for me. I want to give you this suggestion that this is self-pity. It is, a, it is a, a description of self-pity because he said, my feet were almost gone. Now, anytime you examine some problem, you would, you would want to, to examine who, what, where, when, how, right? That's some reasonable questions. So when you, when you examine this, you look at this word gone, it means to stretch, to spread out, to bend away, including moral deflection, to decline, to go down, to be gone, to be overthrown. How often many people can be overthrown in their faith. They just walk away from God. I, you, you know, hey, listen, when, when you're truly born again, it doesn't mean that you can't be beat down. You've got to let God take control of your life. You've got to let the Word of God saturate your life, and you've got to stand with truth. Amen. Right. A friend of mine told me many years ago, he said, let me, let me tell you something. He said, you say you're called to preach. He said, but I'm going to tell you right now, whatever you do for God, you're going to do it alone. That really didn't make any sense when he first told me that. But you know what? If you're going to stand for truth, you may be the only guy standing. Your mother might not stand with you. Your daddy might not stand with you. Your children might not stand with you. Your, your spouse might not stand with you. Stand anyway. Just stand on the truth. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. What's the next thing that he say? In verse 2, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well not slipped. He's telling us what happened. So this, we're looking at the, the what. The word slipped means... Uh, it means to spill forth or for t uh, figuratively to expend life, your soul, to make a complaint or to slip. You know, the Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
But after their own lust shall they heap uh, to themselves teachers having itching ears, that they sh- and, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Well, that's not this guy's, this, this, this de- description here of his condition is because why. So we know the what he said. I, I, notice what the verse said. My feet were almost gone. My steps had well not slipped. So, he's, he, so why, why, why and when? Look at it. Next verse. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Do you know the foolish and the prosperity of the wicked can really block and blur your vision of their end? Did you hear what I said? You're, you're, listen, the foolish and their prosperity of the wicked can blur your vision on their end. Do you know Jeremiah even asked the question in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. And here's two questions. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they, uh, are, wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? You know, you can look even in your own life and especially in today and look at the prosperity of the wicked and say, how in the world can this happen? And if you're not careful, you'll get so sidetracked and observing it, it'll get you discouraged. You and I are not immune to discouragement. Right? Asaph in Psalm 73 and Jeremiah said, you can see these things. And you know what? It caused current perplexity in the aspects of the foolish and the wicked in their perceived, their perceived prosperity. And here's what I'm trying to share with you. You have to look at their end. You have to come to the word of God and realize their end. You cannot look at their current condition and think, where's justice? I mean, that's what we hear. And how can, so how can the view be skewed? By not taking into account that the prosperity of the wicked may be very, very prevalent, but is very, very short. You see that? You understand? So the Bible said in Psalm 37, verse 1, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Okay, look at me, and let's go to uh, Proverbs 19. Let's go there. Hold your place in Psalm 73. We're coming right back. Look at Proverbs 19. Hold your place in Proverbs 19, and let's, let's flip right back to Psalm 73. So we're at... We've got our finger in, in, in Proverbs 19, and we want to look at Psalm 73, and we're going to look at verse 3b. Notice what it says. So in verse 3, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There's the when. When he started looking at their prosperity, he then, he then says, my, my, my steps are almost gone my feet had well not slipped. I was in trouble. So look with me in, in Proverbs 19 and verse 1. Notice what it says. So in Psalm, let me reason with you very briefly. In Psalm 73, he says, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, that's when I was shaken. Right? You with me? He's not considering their what? End. He's not considering their end. He's only looking at their current condition. That's like that guy that jumped out of the 30-story building, 30 stories, jumped out. And uh, somebody at the 24th floor said, how you doing? He said, fine right now. <laughs> you're only looking at their current condition. You're not looking at their end. You have to look at their end. Okay, so Proverbs 19, verse 1. Better is the poor. Okay, wait. I was, I was envious when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Notice what the Bible says. Better is the what? Poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a what? Hey, look. In Proverbs 19, uh, I mean, in Proverbs 24, 19, fret not thyself, fret not thyself because 
of these evil people and be not envious at the wicked. He says, he says, uh, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked in Psalm 73, 3. God is telling you it'd be better poor, you'd be better to be poor than you'd be a, foolish doing, a fool doing whatever you want to do. Verse 2, also the soul that be without knowledge, it is not good, and he that hasteth with his feet sinneth. The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. So they're fretting, you're fretting, and why are you fretting? What are you fretting over? You've got to look at their end. Now, Let's go back to Psalm 73. All right, so in Psalm 73, verse 3, the Bible says, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. This word wicked means morally wrong. It means a bad person. And what was, what was happening in the psalmist's life is that he was focused on what is temporary. And I, I, I pray that you listen to me right here. He's focusing on what is temporary, and it shook his stability. It, 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 it caused difficulty with his feet and the surety of his steps. Notice what it says here in verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I, what's that little three-letter word, saw. Where you look and where you will focus matters. If you take a horse with blinders in a parade, do you know why they keep those blinders on? Well, I'm told. I'm not a horseman. But I'm told that they put those blinders so that horse can't get distracted. Have you ever seen a horse get distracted in a crowd? It is ugly. And what they do is they put the blinders on them. Do you know that when you're riding a bicycle, and it doesn't matter what speed, it doesn't matter whether you're going slow, or it doesn't matter whether you're going fast. And I'm talking about over 30 miles an hour. You may be doing 30, 40 miles an hour on a bicycle. And uh, the fastest I've been down Rush Hill was 52. So I hit 52 miles an hour on a bicycle going down Rush Hill. And you know what I discovered? If there's debris in the road, if you'll find the gap between the debris, you look at that, you focus on that, and those bike tires will go right through that uh, debris. It's a, I guess you do the same thing on a motorcycle. What you focus on, what you look at matters. And Lot is a prime example, is he not? He looked on the fields of the well watered. You see, you and I need to keep in, keep in sight that we need to look at the end of it all. Look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Hold your place in Psalm 73. Psalm 37, look at the end of it all. Verse 2, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and withereth as a green herb. That's their end. Notice what it says to you. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. You know, as a little boy, there's, uh, my dad would go watch high school football games. And about, about the, the middle of the third quarter, my friends would, would come down. I went to a very large school because it was... K-5 all the way through uh, high school. And uh, it was about a 1,000 kids went there. But about the, I don't know, four or five minute mark, these, these friends of mine would call me and say, hey, man, let's go under, underneath the bleachers. And what, there was a big area under the, the bleachers, and we'd play our own game. Where they're out there focused on what they're doing. We're not even paying attention. We could hear the crowd yell and stuff. But we, we, uh, but we did the same thing in, in uh, baseball when we were not playing. We'd get these Dixie cups. Do y'all know what a Dixie cup is? Those little wax cups. And you could break. Anybody guilty of talking about what I'm saying? You break those little cups down, right? And then you play baseball. And those things will hurt if you threw them hard enough. 
and, and you throw those balls, and you're not even paying attention to what's going on. You know what I really believe in the big scope of things? Now, many times as a Christian, we get so discouraged about what's going on that we just walk up under the bleachers and start playing with Dixie cups. We're not even focused on what's going on in the field. But as I grew older, I, I was the guy on the field, and I wasn't focused on the stupid stuff. Behind, I mean, I know it's not stupid. They're having a great time. They're behind the, they're behind the, the stands. I'm not paying attention to what the, what's going on there because we're trying to win a football game. Hello? If you're walking with God good enough to where God is pleased with your walk, you don't have to worry about what's going on with the Dixie Cup game. You don't have time to look at it. You don't even have time to check what the score is. You don't know because you're not paying attention to it. You're focused on what the goal is, and that's to get across the goal line and go to heaven one day. Not, 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 not speaking of works. You're only saved by grace. Now, let me, let me bring this to you. I want you to look at me in Psalm 73, and I, I want you to notice one more thing, and then we'll, we'll pick this up later. So we see in verse um, 3, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw. So he's envious because he looked, he faced discouragement and perplexity. And it's all because this fascination with their prosperity. Do you know that the wicked's end is nothing to envy? The scripture speaks repeatedly of their demise. And then you just examine the problems with wealth by itself. Now, if God's made you wealthy, I'm, that's, hear, hear what the Lord said. If a man is not saved yet he's wealthy, that can wind up being an obstacle in his life. Listen to this. Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So with what this envy does and this looking does, where he's focused, the fascination with their prosperity, why, why is he fascinated with their prosperity? What do you think he's really battling? He's battling internal lust to have what they have. Because he makes that argument late, later on, hey, I've washed my hands in innocency. His sinful envy and foolishness was really in itself, as he's looking at them, is sinful and it's foolish to consider. Listen, he's considering the blessings that they appear to have. But the Bible said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So in, in Psalm 1, 1 through 3, God said, You follow me, you're going to be like a tree that is planted, and you are going to prosper. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible said, you follow the word of God, you're obedient to the word of God, you're going to make your way prosperous and successful. You don't have to look on the world uh, at the wicked and the foolish in envy and fret over that because you don't have what apparently they have. Stop. It's, it's like dealing with a horse woman. Do you know the Bible said a horse woman's feet are where? Where are they? In what? They're in hell. Stop looking at her face and look at her feet. Stop looking at her face and look at her feet. Stop looking at their perceived, uh, their, their alleged prosperity and realize their end. It is absolute.